Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and another difficult conversation to make good trouble with the, this is too cliche, the lovely and talented Tita Patterson, mediator, <laughs> arbitrator, and master of many trades and tolerant enough to deal with both Ben Davis and me at the same time. That's an accomplishment in and of itself. And uh, Professor Emeritus, also known as Dude Emeritus Ben Davis, hey, University of Toledo School of Law, hey, again, recently published author of many articles, actually. So, hey, Ben, you were starting to tell us about hey, something that just came to your attention. So, so yeah, today I, I watched a, uh, a presentation by an author who basically is talking about uh, uh, who, who's basically talking about uh, con artists, con artists. So I was like, she'd written a whole book about the con and the the, the way people con people. She wrote, and uh, so one of the things that was being asked was, well you know, how do you get people out of a con, all right? And because uh, the way that, that basically what the con artist does is they play on either your hopes or your fears, two sides of the coin. And they say to you what you want to hear. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated you are or anything like that. They're really good at tapping your emotions, right? She does this whole wonderful analysis about it. And uh, well, ultimately, what she was uh, saying was pretty pessimistic, which is that once people are in on the con and they're, 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 they are so in that, you know, there's, you can throw anything at them, any logic, rational data, you know, what, you know, but they're like, it, they just feed it into their, you, you don't understand the con machine. You don't, you don't understand the reality thing. And so those machines like QAnon and all those kinds of things that we see, right? Uh, the people who are into that, they're like impervious to that, uh, being pulled out of that. So the question was, well, how do you get them out? And the only thing that the person said was, you have to have these people who are like, they, she called them infiltrators, like cult infiltrators who become part of the thing. And then what they do is they speak the language of the true believers and introduce doubt into that that's and you might be lucky to get somebody to come out of that so you know with regards to the the all this election stuff going on right now you know biden made that speech right that magnificent speech but in the people who are in on the big lie it's totally impervious to them they, they're totally impervious to it because it's you know it doesn't fit into the the, the big lie con and really the you know, then the, the 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 people who change it are the Republicans who are, so to speak, in the con, who uh, would uh, challenge the con, raise issues about it. You know, those guys like Kins Kinzinger and Cheney, the way that they're challenging it, then makes them to be excluded, right? So I don't know. It's like somebody else has to to you know to kind of talk these people down, like ordinary local. Uh, I would say ordinary local uh, uh, leaders in, in local, you know, city, to towns, and all that. At the same time, the con is so voracious, is voracious that you see that if somebody does say that, then they get the legislature to pass a law to take their power away from them, right? So that they, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It's fascinating to think uh, that, you know, this is how screwed up we are. <laughs> and how, how are we and, and we're not getting any help from the Supreme Court, you know? I, I read Alito's thing, and uh, I've been cogitating over Alito's Brnovich uh, versus Democratic National Party. And, you know, I was reading, there are these sites to some cases where the court said that, you know, did you have a chance to participate in the democratic process? That was part of why they would leave things alone. And I was like, well, of course, you know, people get to vote. And the people, they, but, you know, it's always majority-minority, right? You know, the idea was it's supposed to protect the, uh, 
imagine the Supreme Court trying to protect the rights of those who are not in the majority in a given place. But he was, you know, it's kind of like, kind of like saying, if you lose in the political setting, too bad, so sad. You know, I said, that's pretty limited view of your of your role, Mr. Mr. Justice Alito. You know, so I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I remain optimistic, and I know I'm not in on that con. And then the other con is the critical race theory one, right? That's going on right now. And I was thinking, you know, what's going on is that there was another con that's been going on for a long time, which was the sort of bleached history that we all had back in school, right? That was a con that we were all bought into and we believe is reality. And now you're trying to tell us that's not the reality that was really the reality. You know, there's so much resistance from all these parents because literally the bleached history that they learned is uh, they're finding out it's not really that true. But you, and you see how hard it is to get people to, to, uh, to accept that. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but there were, you know, just a couple of thoughts that struck me in this wonderful time we live in. So, Tina, am I crazy? Oh, absolutely not. You're not crazy. We're in the midst of change. And this is literally, um, we live in a, a, a quick gratification society. Um, we expect things to happen quickly and in a, in a blink of an eye. But we are in we are in the midst of social change, and it's happening gradually. It's I think of it more or less like the industrial revolution. Um, yeah. You know, there were people who pushed back, who couldn't believe it, who weren't informed. But it's happening. We will either be part of the change, or we will be we will become obsolete. And obsolete can mean you have thinking that no longer um, aligns with. I'll say the greater collective, because I think there will always be that person who's the outlier or the contrarian. But um, what with this back and forth right now, and I'll I'll talk about the the election uh, specifically because I think this is where we see a lot of the pushback, and we see, we're seeing a lot of this um, resistance. And part of it is, like you said, it's the con. It's the I'm going to feed into your fear. I'm going to feed into that 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 kernel of desperation or discomfort, and I'm going to exploit it. There's a, it's, it's not, it's not happenstance that we have a former president who is more vigorous now in some of the rhetoric that he's spouting and that we have a, our national legislative body literally going back and forth over voting rights, something that we th most of us thought was prob were probably addressed in the 1960s. And the fact that we, we literally are seeing this deconstructed yet again, um, and you, we've talked about it, you have, I have, Chuck has, it's, dis it's, it's discomforting, it's unsettling, but until the larger group of us says, no, get one, get, I'm voting you out of office, two, we will do whatever we need to do so that you can exercise your right to vote. All these additional quizzes, poll taxes, whatever you want to call it, it literally gets is, is addressing that, that fear. I don't want the other voting. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's Republican, Democrat, it's the other. I don't want the other voting. I, I see you smiling, Chuck. So I'll, I'll pause there to see what you have to say on this. No, and, and Ben, you were talking about the voting rights case, and Tina, you're talking about the voting repression, voting suppression measures. Oh, absolutely. And besides that, there's gerrymandering and all of these things. And Ben, you're right, right in Alito's opinion, he attempts to justify the voting restrictive measures as legitimate fraud prevention measures. Well, not only is there no evidence of fraud in this election, in fact, it's the most closely supervised, monitored, re-evaluated election in our history. And it's clean, over 60 lawsuits with no evidence. Exactly. In fact, to the level now, where there are actually judges 
who are sanctioning lawyers who brought those lawsuits. Yeah. Because there's no evidence to support them. Hey. Yeah. And where we're not seeing people step up is within the ranks of that Republican Party, where one or two people, Cheney, Murkowski, maybe one or two others, but you've got hundreds of Congress people, Republican Congress people, close to half of whom voted against certifying the election results that their own minority leader has now acknowledged resulted in the legitimate election of the Biden-Harris ticket. And I guess one of the things, and I hope this is not a digression, I'm remembering back to when I was a kid and the family in the house next door to ours, the father in the family was the leader of the Republican Party in Wisconsin. And a close friend and kind of Calabash uncle was a man who was governor twice. He was a legislator in Wisconsin. And they were very dyed in the wool Republicans. But I never remember having anyone engage in the kind of dehumanizing, angry, antagonistic name calling type of use of language that we're seeing now. If you take a position to support the rebuilding of this country and the restoration of the economic base of the decimated middle and lower middle class, you're called a socialist. Yeah. You're not, and, and it, you're called that in a very dehumanizing way as if you are less than a person, you're not entitled to respect. You're not entitled to consideration because you take this position. Right. And, and, so and my question that, you know, what will it take to get us back to where people look at each other, treat each other and talk to each other as human beings? I, I, I don't know what it will take quite honestly, except, uh, you know, we, we get tired, we get tired of it, you know, at some point, like, there's like an ex existential exhaustion on the, of everyone with it. Uh, the, but the, then what will happen is you typically have some new actors, some new ambitious folks, who, you know, and donors, uh, who are willing to finance it, you know, because that's what the one of the things also I get, I get very curious about with all this that's going on is, this stuff takes money to make it keep going like this. And who is providing the money to keep this thing going? Because, I mean, if you look at it at the 33,000 foot level or the billionaire level, this is great because nothing done means I keep all I got. And that's exactly what I want. So let's have more chaos and I will finance chaos to make sure that nothing literally gets done until the Republicans are in, and then I can get them to give me even more. You know, it's just like a, and they've got the funds to pull that off. I mean, I just saw that Jeff Bezos just, you know, dropped a dime on the Smithsonian, two hundred million dollars, which is the largest gift to the Smithsonian in its history, and that's not even a rounding error on his one hundred ninety-five billion dollars. You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's a level that, so I. I, I don't know, and obviously there could be small small uh, donors too, but there's got to be a lot of money in, in this in this con to be made from doing this con. And plus, the people who do the con. That was the other thing I learned in this presentation. What they're into is the power, the power to shape people's thinking, to change people's thinking, to have you know to to pull the strings, the puppet master. That's the that's the that's the thrill, and you can see. Uh, certainly with Trump, how he loves that. I mean, that's really what really he gets off with, like these cereal companies that created lousy stuff, but, you know, Trump University, Trump Stakes, Trump, you know, it's like everything was a magical, you know, a way to make a little money off some people and play them for chumps, quite honestly, you know. But anyway, it's not just Trump. It's, you know, there's a lot of people making money off of this, I think. Um, 
And in America, you know, making money is a big thing, right? Well, there's no question. Yeah, go ahead, Tina. I, I'll, I'll wait. Please continue. Hey, no, I was just going to hey, thank Ben for drawing a close connection between hey, the economic power and in inequality, the political power and in inequality, the educational power and in inequality, to try and dictate what kids can learn and talk about in school. Hey, there are threats of criminal penalties for talking about racial inequality in school, for opposing voting suppression in a state legislature. First, Texas Governor Abbott threatened to dock their pay. That didn't do it. They left and they were smart enough to get out of the state so he doesn't have jurisdiction over them. So now he's threatening, if you come back, we're gonna criminally penalize you for walking out on our voting suppression exercise. Right, that's like, if I could say, that's the one trick pony that you see in the authoritarian space, which is essentially what? Criminal, state violence, right? They're criminalizing it, it's always state violence. Levels of state violence, always, 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 in some version of it, right? That's what they do. That's their one trick, that's their one trick pony every time. You're like, amazing, one more time, that's all you got? Is that we're going to threaten you with being arrested and charged with, uh, you know, and then that was kind of the brilliance of Martin Luther King's uh, nonviolent movement. Said, Go ahead and arrest us. Go ahead. And, you know, put us all in jail. You won't have a quorum then either. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, <laughs> because we're all okay. in jail. <laughs> so, Tina, you were about to say. I wanted to pull the thread a little bit further on power because that's underlying, uh, 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 and I think you brought up a good point. It underlies the discussion regarding voting. It underlies the discussion regarding the Alito um, analysis. And it also underlies the, the, the struggle that we're seeing regarding critical race theory, the power, who has the power. So um, I, I guess my question for the two of you is if, if this is really about um, grabbing power, holding on pow holding on to power, what does it mean when that power is unraveled, both for in, in, the, in the context of voting, whether that's legislation, voter suppression, voter oppression, and, and, and what we teach our children or what we teach what we teach each other and regarding race and interacting with one another. So that's my question for you. Yes, I'm taking on the role of a talk show host now. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll take a stab at it, Chuck. Okay. Uh, Good. Uh, with, with regard to what we teach our, our children, um, I think there's a guy in West Virginia made a great comment. It says, and it's a, it's a little off color, but I'll say it is that just because you want to be a dumbass doesn't mean my kids have to be a dumbass. And so as a parent, you want to make sure your kids get the quality education with the breadth of knowledge that's there. And so you have to, you know, as many black parents have done, certainly for probably centuries, at least, you know, it's like this fight in the school to get your kid the stuff that they need. Um, and, I, and I would say, actually, for black and white and all kinds of parents who want to have a, you know, an accurate vision of the subject matters, that's the battle they have to fight, is to keep the school being accurate and not having fantasy, uh, or what I like to call dumbing down of their kids in a, in a worldwide competitive space where kids, you know, there are kids around the world who are moving, marching ahead while we're playing these mind games. And for your kids, you know, that, that, that's, that's the thing. In terms of how we talk to each other, you know, it always, I mean, you know, that there are screamers, uh, uh, sure, but, you know, we're all human, right? And, and I think that there's a certain level of, if we don't recognize the humanity in each other, then that's our problem. Because to the extent that you don't recognize humanity in somebody, um, then you're othering them. Now, that somebody else doesn't recognize your humanity, 
how long have we seen that? You know, I mean, really, how, you know, I used to talk to people in Paris and say the difference between living in Paris and living in the United States was in Paris, I knew I wasn't French, so I, therefore I wasn't civilized, right? Because the only people who are civilized are the French, but I knew I was human. The French always competed me as a human, you know? But in the States, sometimes I wondered if people were considering me human, actually, you know, with all the, the history. Uh, and I just think that if we recognize the humanity of, uh, of, of the others, no matter how obnoxious they are or something like that, that's like the, the, the base level thing, because if we don't recognize the humanity in that other person, then in some sense, we, we are, you know, I mean, we have to fight with them, but we can't disallow them from, uh, uh, we, we can't fall into that, that uh, twisted space where we deny the humanity in the other, because once you start denying the humanity in the other, you go down a whole path of battles of you know, disenfranchisement and all that stuff. So that, that would be the second. The third thing I would just say is that um, it is a period of transition. The con book I read or the person who did the con thing said, this is particularly the kinds of periods when people are in transition in their lives where they're vulnerable to the con, right? This is like a really good time. And the social media thing is like a con on steroids machine, right? So if you, if you have sort of that kind of outlook, which I found really helpful from this person, that we're vulnerable, the cons are possible. And then, you know, trying to remain lucid. I like to say to people, you know, you can, you can be uh, innocent, but don't be naive. That's all. Yes. Just, just don't be naive, you know? Yes. You know, you have grounded in some things, um, you know, grounded in, in uh, how you were raised with regards to your, your faith or, um, I mean, a little, uh, there was a little thing like there was a lady who wanted to get three Slurpees and only had a money for two. And this young black guy behind me put the money up right away to cover for the third one. So she could go out with the three for the kids in the car. Right. And I looked at him and said, you were raised well. You know, you were raised well that you were just going to help out a little bit. It's not a big thing, but you were raised well by your parents about being neighborly, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so then I paid for his thing, you know? And so, you know, we've got this little thing going, which was just, just recognizing human decency, you know? That's, I think, is a huge thing if we could just get to that point. Although all the political types try to, you know, get us all not recognizing the basic human decency that we should each have towards each other. But, um, you know, yeah, but I think as we go into our last couple of minutes, <laughs> And what you're hitting in, and Tina, what your question brought out, it kind of draws my thought to what happened in the 2020 presidential elections that overcame all of that divisive, dehumanizing stuff and made choices for people that are decent human beings and that are trying their best to restore that as the tone and spirit of this country. Can that happen again? What's it gonna take? <laughs> Last remarks? Dina, I spoke so much, you, know, you wanna take it on? Um, I will, I, 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 and I'm trying to think of the, the right words or sentence, but it, it's that, it's that spirit of endurance. It's the tenacity, it's the, it's the desire to be acknowledged and to to exercise one's opinion and and hope that those who either are perceived to have power or actually have power will listen and act upon what they're being told. I, that's what I saw in 2020. Yes, there are people who are believing something else, but there's a greater there, there was a greater number of people who said, I, I can't live like this. I refuse to live like this. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to quote Malcolm X by my, by any means necessary. And I'm, again, I'm taking that quote out of context, but people did what they needed to do, whether that was driving others to the polls, standing in line in the rain, you know, waiting hours for food and people bringing food to them because, because of that, that basic desire to, be recognized and seen and respected. Yeah. And what a great place to wrap this one up. 
that maybe what really happened is exactly what you're saying, is that enough people said enough already. We're going to let our vote show who we really are. Yes. We hope that can happen again. Thank you all. Thank you. Another great session. Come back, visit with us in two weeks and send us your questions. Thanks so much. Take care.